but it probably would disguise it as well. You know, I mean, this is probably more prone for guys than girls, but ultimately, Maybe. you know, if you have got the struggle is real though, because like my daughter has the same hair and she wants it to get long, but you know, it has to grow quite Heavier. a lot for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 one of those things. I think if you have curly hair, folks, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I think I think it's going to come back to you. Don't ever think that it's a bad thing. Um, because it's uh, I think it's I think it's really good. Um, anyway, um, listen, we're live, everybody. So welcome to Brain Food Live on Air, bringing it to you every Friday, no fail. It's episode two two five. Um, and today, uh, this has been in the planning for a long time, at least planning in my own head, as well as planning for this event, um, because it's, it's one of those topics I don't think has ever been covered in our industry, uh, which is what is the psychological impact uh, of the various candidate assessment types that we subject candidates to. Um, we construct our assessment processes, CV review, presentation, technical test, whatever it may be, and how many times do we actually think, what is the psychological requirement we're asking for these people? Is it the same universally? Do people react differently to it? Is there a gender component? Is there an age component? Is there an ethnicity component? Is there a regional component? Is there a seniority component? I suspect there is, but we've never talked about it. So today, that's what we're going to talk about, the psychological impact of candidate assessments. Um, and if you're interested in this topic and this is what you wanted to watch, you're in the right place. Um, okay, let's do some, um, before, actually, before we introduce Linnea, let me just uh, do some sound checks, make sure everyone can hear me okay. Uh, folks, if you're in Crowdcast, and you're watching it here, uh, let me know whether the audio is fine and you can hear and see me and Linnea on screen. Uh, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, which I think a half a dozen of you might be, uh, let me know in the common thread there whether the audio is fine on LinkedIn. In fact, let me just quick check. I keep forgetting, but as I check on my mobile phone, I'll be able to see whether we're live there or not. Um, I suspect we might not be actually, because we've had loads of crap going on with LinkedIn API, uh, which is kind of causing issues. Um, but yeah, it looks like we're okay there on LinkedIn as well. So, okay, cool. Excellent stuff. Linnea Bywall, wonderful to see you on, on, on the show. And you're the co-host today. So excellent. Thank you. Um, why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do, uh, Linnea? Happy to. So Linnea, I'm the head of people at a Swedish uh, scale-up called Alva Labs. And we work with candidate assessments. So we help customers uh, make efficient and accurate hires with psychometric tests, uh, structured interviews, coding tests. But I think for the sake of this conversation, I'm also a licensed psychologist. So hopefully that can help. Uh, but been in the, uh, I've discussed um, psychological impact related to psychometric tests for 10 years, uh, but have never like had this conversation around like the full scope. So I'm a mega pumped. Yeah, this is, I remember, so Linnea and I had a chat maybe a year or so ago at an event and we ended up talking exactly about this topic. So this thing's been brewing for like at least a year and a bit. So I'm, I'm delighted to, to finally uh, bring it to, to you all. Um, okay, so folks, let's get on with the show. Um, actually, before we do that, we need to thank our sponsors before we do anything because we can't do these shows without our sponsor support. And every week a company steps up and says, you know what, we're going to help you uh, keep this show on the road. Uh, this week's sponsor is Tripad. Tripad.com, of course, one of the leading ATSs in the UK. A wonderful product used by some of the biggest companies um, in, the, uh, in, in the country and some of the biggest public sector spaces as well. Um, but let me not sort of bore you with um, Tripad sort of speak because we can actually bring some people on uh, to talk about that themselves. So why don't we just invite Neil on? Uh, he, I believe, is the CEO of Tripad. So let me just bring him on. He can hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, what is this company? What, is it, what, is it, what does it all do? So Neil, I've just invited you onto screen. There should be a pop-up. All you've got to do is accept this um, and you'll be, uh, you'll be on, uh, on air. Um, cool stuff. Um, uh, so what else should we talk about while Neil is, is getting on here? Um, oh yeah, folks, you know about, oh, here he is. Um, there he is, Neil Armstrong. Wonderful to see you, Neil. Good afternoon. Um, the, all this talk of curly hair made me feel very jealous at the start of the call. <laughs> Neil, I was thinking of you, mate, um, because I was thinking because I'm 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 not losing my hair, but I'm paranoid about it. Um, so I'm like undergoing treatments, rosemary oil, you know, all this type of stuff. It's all happening. Um, so preemptive preemptive sort of action. 
Um, but yeah, this is why I went, you know, when Linnea's going on about curly hair, I was thinking, actually, you're quite blessed because I think the curly <laughs> hair, you're going to preserve it longer than most. Um, anyway, Neil, um, wonderful to see you. And I actually saw you at IHR last week, but you were corner my eye and you were busy and I didn't want to bust in and interrupt. So, and then you, the moment was gone, but uh, I did see you there. So hopefully you had a good time there. Um, uh, why, don't you, um, why don't you say a few words about Tripad? What is Tripad? Who needs to care about it? What what but your segment to your service, uh, why is it a good ATS for, co for companies to consider? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the introduction, Hun. And uh, yeah, IHR was a great show last week. Loads of interesting talks going on. So, so many fascinating things happening in the industry. Um, yeah, Tripad, uh, we're a talent acquisition platform. So uh, applicant tracking system, onboarding, video interviewing uh, for, for companies who are scaling up, looking to deliver a, a fantastic candidate experience. Um, we're on a mission to make recruitment uh, fairer, faster and better. So, so really pride ourselves on giving our customers the tools to make sure that their recruitment process is um, helping them deliver on their, their EDI objectives. Um, I think one of the reasons this, this week's topic is just so fascinating is, is that whole area of behavioral psychology, how that comes together with, with recruitment uh, and attraction and um, making our recruitment open and accessible to people with all kinds of different backgrounds and allowing them to shine, I think is so important because I, I, I see a drive in, you know, and I think probably recruitment technology vendors are guilty of this, of, you know, let's make everything faster, faster, more efficient, faster, let's automate everything. And, and actually, as, as, as recruiters, you know, we're looking to make a human emotional connection, right? We're, we're trying to get the candidate to fall in love with our company and buy into our company culture and, and want to stay for years and contribute as a big part of their lives. So, um, yeah, this this whole area of, of, of psychology is, is fascinating for me. Yeah, it's very, very important. You know what? There's been a lot of like um, uh, candidate centric uh, posts online that I've seen recently that are actually quite sophisticated um, in just recording sort of their experiences of going through online applications and so on. Uh, and we know that a lot of the ATSs out there do kind of contribute to the experience, particularly how they've designed how people might uh, encounter a job and then how they flow through it. Um, and, you know, some of the older technologies out there obviously have had very difficult sort of uh, high friction type of approaches in. And that's caused all kinds of people having, I wouldn't say trauma is probably too overused the word, but you can imagine someone having to go through it over and over again being actually very difficult so one guy had to set up i mean i think you must have just forgot his email so it's partially responsible but he recorded that he had like 209 workday accounts um because oh, because because he considered each one just a disposable thing he didn't feel like it was a long-term thing to preserve so he said got another thing to set up and he just applied and then he forgot about it next time he saw another job had to set another one up and apply it again and you can imagine that repetition just grinding away at someone's morale um and of course uh, that is no bueno. So Tripad hopefully has a much more modern way of dealing with it. I think the interface and the onboarding side is actually one of the strengths. Uh, Tripad.com, uh, do check that business out. And there's also Tripad Grow now. So when you want to tell us a little bit about that, that that's addressing a slightly dis different segment, isn't it, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. We, we'd always worked with larger organizations. So, um, you know, typically at least a thousand employees. Uh, and we we, we basically just realized we were turning away so many companies who kept coming to us and said, oh, you know, we've got 500 staff, 750 staff. And, and we'd say, you know, we're probably not the right platform for you. Uh, and so really what, what we did was just look at how do we simplify the system, simplify the implementation, uh, lower the price point, make it a bit more accessible so that, you know, growing businesses can have the, the same power of tools that, you know, enormous organizations like Tesco and Sodexo and the Church of England can have. Um, but on a, a lower price point, something simpler. And um, yeah, it's, it's taking off uh, you know, really, really well. So yeah, thanks for that. Fantastic. No worries, Neil. We're doing a webinar series separate with Tripad Grow on that. So focusing on those solo recruiters that typically are working on the SMB market. So make sure you check that out. Okay, Neil, listen, wonderful to see you. Stay with us um, uh, for the rest of the show. We might be able to bring you back on a bit later, uh, but go and enjoy the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much for introducing Tripad and supporting uh, Brave Through Ladder Brené, mate. Good. Thanks, Hung. Cool. By the way, I'm just checking some of the chat here, and I'm surprised that people are, are confirming that Workday require a new account with every instance. Um, so <laughs> I can totally imagine. Yeah, like they're the dominant ATS out there. I think there's 9% market uh, share. All the ATS is a very fragmented market, obviously, but a, Workday do, are dominant, so they've got 9%. 
So basically, every time you encounter a Workday uh, instance in a new company, you have to set up a new account. That's absolutely crazy. Um, Bob Pulver, thirty-one Workday accounts. Yasmin is saying it doesn't actually apply. Don't actually apply if it is Workday. Wow, 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 wow! Huge things that need to be done there. Obviously, that's part of what we're talking about. The psychology of it. It's a deterrent. It's to the point where you're no longer interested in doing it. Um, rather than review the new newsletter, Linnea, why don't we dive into your experience here and your thought process? Because you wrote me a really interesting breakdown as to how you thought about this. So let's go through through that. I think it'll be more interesting for the audience. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this aspect of psychology and, and, and how we sort of, uh, how different assessment types actually um, influence uh, how people feel when they, go, when they go see these things? Yeah, sure. I think the first thing we need to keep in mind is that it's a very like weird situation. A like hiring process is me putting like, everything I am on the table and then I risk rejection like the most likely answer is actually rejection if we have 100 candidates one will get the job there's 99 people that will not get the job and if we just go to like the fundamental like human brain one of the like strongest like areas of anxiety is when we don't feel that we are uh, let, let into a social group when we are rejected when we are not part of a like community the reason for that is because that's our like survival instinct back in the days we like our survival was based on collaborating as a group that's why we're now the dominant species on or on the world because we were so good at collaborating but that meant that you had to be part of a group and to some extent like that's what's happening when we're applying for a job like i'm asking someone like can i play with you and they have all the power so that's kind of like a good foundation to have with you um the second aspect i think is is relevant to to race here is that there's probably no size fits all like unfortunately that would be fantastic if like do x y z and everyone will be happy but the reality is that everyone will have their Kind of baggage their story and will react different to different assessment methods different types um so it's more likely that we need to optimize for as many as possible and be flexible with how we can adapt uh, more so than finding that like silver bullet um and i i, I guess like the final like the third aspect i want to highlight here is to me and like what we're trying to do at, at Alva when we're recruiting for, for us or when we're helping customers recruit um, is to just put the candidate in the driver's seat. How can we make sure that they shine? And like hi having that mindset of it's not that we're trying to bust them of not being great, but rather like how can we set them up for success where they can show that they're great? Um, we do that a lot by preparing, trying to be as transparent as possible. Like this is what's going to happen. This is why it's going to happen. These are the assessment criteria so that you know. So I think just being aware that it's really scary. It's going to differ for everyone and try to be like, set everyone up for success as much as possible. I guess those are my three kind of main themes when I think about this topic. No, very good themes to chew on as well. And we'll leave with that when we bring the other guests on the show. But I, 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 these things are worth underlining. So let's understand that no one enjoys looking for a job. Um, uh, you know, this is a miserable experience. I know we all say candidate experience could be improved, etc. Yes, it can be on the edges. But the fundamental reality is um, looking for a job is a high stress scenario. And precisely for the reasons you, you suggested, um, because I'm, I'm the job applicant is a supplicant, right? I am literally saying, um, I want your job. Please judge me worthy of that job. <laughs> yeah. Like imagine that scenario. I, ch I, I would imagine that there's no scenario where that you that would feel amazing. Like we can only make it feel less worse. Um, so candidate yeah. experience is kind of making that fundamental uh, power imbalance feel less worse. Um, second aspect you mentioned really important, kind of a lack of, uh, uh, lack of agency. Like we are funneled into this pipe. Uh, we literally call it a pipeline, right? We move yeah. people through process at no point is, does the candidate able to 
pause the process without some drama going on, like the recruiter is going to be pressuring them, you know, why are you pausing? Um, and it, oftentimes it's a competitive thing. So you, you can't go slow because another person, you know, is competing. So you're, you're, everyone's like feeling as if they're moving faster than they want. Um, and candidate not in control. Imagine other sort of analogous situations where you do not feel in control over something that is particularly, you know, potentially life-changing not not comfortable and finally sometimes it's like set up in an adversarial way like a hostile environment yeah right? yeah like the st structure i think someone even joked on the on the chat to say yeah maybe you're measuring grit and you know what i do remember back in the day certain recruitment processes were actually designed to penalize almost like masochistically um or is it sadistically i think sadistically uh uh kind of uh, uh challenge uh the, the candidate to see who is prepared to go through the wall here in yeah. order to get the job so yeah. again how can that be pleasant right so i i saw a post i don't know if it was a joke or not but like for the sake of the uh to show an example there was a candidate sharing like i was applying for a job and we were like in the waiting room to be interviewed and we sat there for like six hours before we got like called to the interview because the recruiter was six hours late and then it turned out like that was the process. The one that stayed got the job because that one was like the most dedicated. I hope it's a joke, um, but there's probably some, you know, no uh, smoke without fire kind of deal. No, but, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I don't think it's a joke. I, I, I think certain people would would, would uh, sort of recruit that way. And um, and you know what? Half of me, the, the, so the bad half of me, there's a big bad half of Hung Lee, right? Um, but the bad half of me thinks, okay, fair enough. You know I mean? Ultimately, if someone sets his or her business up in this way, then maybe that's the, the ship they want to run, you know, sure. off you go. So, um, so, so that's how we, we play it. Um, but on the other hand, the good half of me thinks, you know, maybe there should be some baseline ethics and how you treat people. Um, cause actually there is like wider effects. So if you have this brutal recruitment approach, as you mentioned, right at the beginning of the conversation, Linnea, one higher 99 rejects, let's say. Uh, yeah. those 99 people are going to go out there and just you know bitch about recruiters and rightly so they had a horrible experience so yeah. it's not just you you know you you got to think about industry-wide um anyway let's bring on our guests before we go much further um because i want to sort of that really sets the substrate where we want to go but then we can talk particularly about different assessment types because you know what is the psychology of someone who is um even putting a cv together if i say hey put a cv together and send it to me that may not be easy for some people, right? Mm. Um, and you know, what is it to do a presentation? Is that you know, a different thing? So, okay, let's let's get on with it. We've got, um, hang on, I think we've got the right people here. Let me just check. Uh, I've got to do a search here. I know I can do this. I'm not complaining about Crowdcast. I've learned how to do it. Um, but um, I've just got to do some typing. Uh, here we go. Let's go, Jean-Marie. I'm going to invite you now. We have Nikita as well. We might actually bring everyone on at one go if I can, um, but I'm not sure whether I see Eloise or Amanda, but let me see if they're here. Uh, no, Amanda's not here, um, but Eloise, is she here? Uh, oh, Eloise is here. Cool. Let's bring Eloise on. Cool. Um, I, I think Amanda hopefully will join us uh, when she has the chance. Amanda, if I have somehow not found you, can you make yourself available <laughs> and visible? on um on the chat and then we'll we'll grab you there um okay firstly we have we have nikita here nikita uh welcome to the show uh jean marie we can't see your camera can you yeah, can you hear me yeah. though we can hear you but we need to see you bro um yeah yeah don't know what's going on let's give me a minute yeah, yeah. <laughs> go and hover somewhere and fiddle with it we have eloise as well okay wonderful uh, let's say firstly intros uh, nikita can you quickly introduce yourself who are you what is you do Oh, Han, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Thank you for this opportunity for a bit of narcissism. So my name is Nikita, and I've been obsessed with psychometrics for the last 12 years. You might ask how obsessed. Well, I profiled my wife to be with two personality assessments before. Oh, I this is this is going deep and dark straight three. away. Uh yeah, so I can see who's competitive on this call. Uh, so, but by the way, do you know what they say about marriage? It's psychological. One is a psycho, the other one's logical. <laughs> there so, we go. And honestly, uh, despite who's who, it's fine. So I'm obsessed with the stuff, as you can see. So that's pretty much my intro. 
Amazing. And I've just shared uh, Nikita's LinkedIn there. So if you do like the energy, go and connect with uh, Nikita. Um, Eloise, wonderful to see you. Uh, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Yes. Yeah, so I'm Eloise. Uh, I'm a neurodivergent coach. So I do coaching for people who are neurodivergent. That means people who are autistic, who have ADHD, but there's also neurodivergence is way larger. So also Tourette syndrome, uh, Down syndrome would be also considered as neurodivergence, for example. Okay, wonderful. And I've just shared uh, uh, Eloise's LinkedIn into the chat stream there. So make sure you go and connect with her. Um, uh, Jean-Marie, I think you see yeah, there, he's there. I was about to say we're going to roll with it without your, your video. Oh no, uh, video's gone again. Um, what the devil is going on there? Um, no, he's back. It's good, it's good. I'm here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Sorry amazing. That. No worries. Uh, Jean-Marie, uh, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Sure. Thank you for inviting me here. So uh, I'm working with Work Me Tender. We are a consulting company. Basically, what we do, we help uh, companies and TA team to design the best processes and strategies. So like you can hear, I'm French. Sorry about my strong accent. Uh, and please do not hesitate to ask me to repeat if there's something you don't get. And so we, we uh, I'm a work psychologist like you are, uh, Linnea. And um, so uh, the thing is, I, I work one day a week with patients as a work psychologist. So four days a week, uh, I'm with companies and candidates working on different kinds of assessments that we design for them, for our clients. And uh, on the fifth day, I have the opportunity to dig deeper into this assessment consequences, if I may say so, and what they mean on the candidate's part. And uh, so this is, uh, this is why, if I remember well, uh, the first time we, we got in the conversation, uh, you and I hung. Amazing. And by the way, folks, give a rating for Jean-Marie's accent. You like it, you hate it. Let me know in the comments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's, let's get on with this. What I want to do, guys, I want to sort of talk particularly about different types of very conventional assessment types. And then we're going to talk about what we think the psychological impact of those are uh, in, and, and then see whether it benefits some people against others, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's start at the beginning of the pipeline, like anything else. Um, what is the, whenever, like, has anyone got any information about uh, or any kind of insight on uh, the psychological impact of completing an application form? Um, oftentimes you see online application, it says, why do you want to work for Acme.com? Can you tell me something good about yourself? Body da, da, da I mean, is that is that just like completely like vanilla neutral? Anybody should be able to do it, or is there some sort of psychological component we should be aware of that actually maybe super difficult for some people, or maybe actually promoting the wrong kind of responses from another? What are, has anyone got any research or any insight? I'll throw it out open to anybody here. I can start because I'm, I talk a lot. Um, but um, I saw this report there that if it takes more than five minutes for someone to apply, they will not do it. So for me, I think it's, we have gotten so used to like the speed of things. We're now used to like instant reward. Uh, so I think it's like maybe less so of like impact on it. But we, I think we get bored. Uh, so many people tend to lose interest pretty fast. So that's just one thing that I'll throw in there, um, that it needs to be easy and fast. Right. So tolerance of the initial friction point. Um, so maybe we've got used, this is actually similar, I agree, Ed, similar to what we were talking about in a different uh, webinar yesterday, where we were, we we're talking about like our, the, the education that we've received as consumers as to responsiveness, and we're very much used to much quicker responsiveness. And it can be outrageous if we don't get that responsiveness, right? So I know, like, I get a very high cortisol spike whenever a, a website takes more than three seconds to load. Um, I, I had, like, a, a, some capture thing come up early today. Computer nearly went out the window. Uh, you know, it's like, that's the only thing I really get annoyed about. It's like, I need to see this now. Like, I can't wait three seconds. So that's obviously a bit of insanity, but it's. I think I'm 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 a person that's just been educated about you know speed of uh, the responsiveness that we seem to be getting on online uh, activities. Big online form, it's like multi-pager, like straight away, right? It's a bit of a deterrent. Any any thoughts on that? Apart from being like unattractive, would it is it could it possibly be traumatic? Would you say, or uh, uh, does the trauma come later? Um, you know, in the process. 
You well, need to ask a clinical psychologist for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> No, what you just said, uh, Linnea, is very interesting about, about how we perceive uh, the assessment. And I like what you said about setting the candidate for success uh, at the same time. Well, there's, a, there's a concept that we don't talk about very often. So we are talking about candidate experience, like length of process, constraints. Uh, what can I do? What am I, what am I not allowed to do with the process? There, there, there's something else that has been studied um, by a psychologist. So here I'm going to put that hat just for a minute. Uh, it's what we call perceived validity. So you see, uh, you've heard about the validity of an assessment. Like uh, if an assessment is valid, it means that uh, it measures what it is meant to measure. Like it's valid, it's useful, uh, and it does the job. Uh, but on the candidate side, it's a bit different. There's what we call perceived validity. It's, do I feel like... I am assessed on what I think I should be assessed. And so uh, do I think that this, this assessment is worth my time? And do I feel like I'm given the best chances uh, to perform? This is what we said about setting them up for success. It's not about just setting them up for success. We have to show them. We have to make them feel that we gave them the tools to uh, perform to the best of their abilities. And that's something that uh, culturally uh, is not very strong on the assessment part because uh, there's another concept that uh, we call social desirability. Mm -hmm. It's like when you are a candidate, you tend to try to find the trick and tips and, and, and to guess in advance what your HR uh, wants uh, from you during an interview. And so you try to tweak your answers just you know, to, to, make you, to, to make you feel socially desirable because you, you, want, to, to, you, you want to join the crowd, like, uh, like uh, Linnea said. So when you, when you want to avoid social disability, you try to uh, neutralize it. Like you, you have a very neutral assessment uh, and you don't want to give any uh, insight, any tips to your candidates as to what you might expect. But at the same time, so this this is very wrong when you talk about you're talking about candidate uh, experience and about what you might want to expect uh, from them, what you want them to feel like about your your assessment. So there's a very thin line, and I think this is where uh, you mentioned uh, in introduction, uh, Hans, that there's no assessment one there's no one size fits them all, and I think this is. 100% correct and this is what we miss with all these online assessments and some of them are very good but they are not good all the time and it's it really depends on the situation and the candidates yeah but here we come to the main issue and that is the amount of qualifications you need to have to use psychometric assessments so in south africa you need to have an education specifically in psychology psychometrics and then you need to have a six months internship so we're talking about six years and six months and then in order to get a qualification in UK to use psychometrics, you can use an online course, an equivalent of three days, and you become a psychometrician. I'm sorry, but I don't think even Elon Musk's Neuralink is ever going to be there that they can download six years and six months of data into three days. So a lot of stuff gets lost. And when you get qualified in UK, you're not technically a psychometrician in my view. You get qualified in one particular tool, one particular model. I believe it's an indoctrination in the line of thought with that psychometric rather than actually gives you a more wide perspective, which is Jean-Marie, you advocate, because you need to know there's more models out there. So to me, a lot of psychometric qualifications here are just indoctrinations into a particular line of thinking, which is a little bit cultish, if you ask me. And therefore, a lot of these models, you know, some people use disk and selection. That's a model from 100 years ago. Some people use MBTI 1944. Some people use Big Five from 1980s. But the issue is because they're qualified in one assessment, they don't know any better. They think this is personality. They don't realize it's actually just a viewpoint on personality or ability. And there's lots of other assessments because you need to know that toolkit. If, if you only qualified in one tool, so one size does not fit all, you only have one size. So the question is how much freedom you actually have to pick the different assessments for different purposes and you know the backstory with them because i'll tell you a little secret most psychometric personality models tell you more about the author of that model than it does about the client or the candidate and if you don't know the biases behind the model and why it was built you're a bit screwed so yeah 
I, I think I think that's a really valid point. Like, how do you actually are, like, are recruiters equipped to make these decisions as to which, which type of assessments to deploy? Um, and how do we make those decisions? We, we, we certainly don't go through any type of uh, self-training on it. We end up saying, you know what, we probably need this, we probably need that. Um, and we end up just slotting it in based, I guess, on our, you know, uh, fairly arbitrary decision making, I suppose. Um, so that's a very interesting uh, point. Uh, we'll definitely go back to it. And folks, uh, there's some people there making some really interesting questions. Use the Q&A feature if you can, because we're going to go, we're going to basically centralize the questions there and go to them at the end of the show. Otherwise, we're going to miss it as we go through the chat. Um, okay, let's have a think about, um, Eloise, you're about to say something, I believe. Is that right? Uh, yeah, just, uh, I, th I think we were talking just about the application form when you said and you have all of this. And I'm thinking like when you say that about people with ADHD, for example, who can have like issue at one point, get bored and stop. And it's already a big world to maybe to this part of the population to be like, OK, at one point, like, like this is already a big world to stop them. Or if you have to write uh, cover letters and everything, if you have dys dyslexia, it can also be like harder point, like how you already feel judged on something that it's not might not be necessary for the job even. So, yeah. yeah. Very, very important point. And even stuff, as we start learning more about things like dyslexia, like we know, for instance, different font styles actually exacerbate dyslexia um, compared to others. Like how many of us have gone through any kind of audit on what style of font you're using on your website and on your application form? I dare say no one. Um, so, you know, you've immediately created massive access uh, equity problem there because you'd be deterring a bunch of people. Um, and by the way, has it got better with the use of tooling? Probably has. Um, I mean, there's another report coming next week, which everyone should turn up to and, and watch, actually. Um, doing this with Arctic Shores, where they're basically um, uh, kind of reviewing uh, candidate usage of uh, generative AI. Um, and out of 2,000 people, uh, sort of students surveyed, 72% have said they are using uh, uh, generative AI of some type in their job applications. So I think that is a big leveler for a lot of these things. However, um, application forms still exist and people are still, you know, plowing through them or not or abandoning process because, you know, psychologically it's not right. Let's move on to a different type of, 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 uh, of uh, conversation, a sort of assessment type telephone interview. Um, are we still doing telephone interviews? I'm not talking about Zoom, so that's another one we'll talk later. Telephone interview. Hey, I want to get on a call. Recruiters love getting on a call. Um, <laughs> right? Get correct if I'm wrong. But it, I think that I know myself that's psychologically challenging. I do not like doing calls without video. Um, and in fact, I don't talk to some of my friends that are no longer my friends because they insist on doing that. Um, and that's not because I've made some sort of harsh decision. It's because I can't communicate in the way they want to communicate with me. Um, and I really, really struggle because I need to see people's faces, I've realized. Um, now, like, do we know anything about the psychology of that response? Like, why do people feel like very comfortable on calls? Some people feel more comfortable with the call compared to video. Others feel uh, more comfortable um, having audio only and vice versa. Eloise, I think you might have something to say about this because I remember us having a chat in Berlin. I wonder whether you've got any insight you could share as to why some people might prefer, um, uh, I guess, more information compared to less when it comes down to having a conversation. Yeah, and I think it really depends. So some people might have issue just to hear. Like I can also just think about accessibility for people who can have difficulty hearing, but people might also have issue processing, like like having the ability to see people lips, it's always like can already help in some situation to understand better what is being said. But at the same time, I know for me, I I don't like being called like when it's when I'm not expecting it, but I also know like being on the phone, I can walk around, which is also helping me to focus in a way because then I get movement into it. So it's really I think it's really good to give people the the chance to choose what they prefer. Yeah, key point. The choice, I think, makes the difference. And a couple of people here, uh, Ed and Steve, are saying, get on the phones. Dude, I get it, uh, but we, I'd never be a candidate in your job. So that's as simple as that. And maybe that's not big, not a big loss. I, I totally agree. <laughs> you can get a better guy. But, but I'm, I'm one of those that would never pick up the phone. Um, uh, anybody, any thoughts on this? Telephone only. Uh, what's the psychology behind having a call? Why do we like it? Why do we don't? Any thoughts? I think we need to keep in mind that 
a lot of information gets um, gets lost when we only have audio. The like human um, like communication. There's so many like visual cues, uh, and even if you have tone of voice, you don't have like facial expressions, you don't have body language, which makes it often harder to interpret. Uh, and that can obviously be for some people that feels safer, and for others. That's why it's scary, because I don't know how is the person on the other side, meaning the recruiter, reacting to my like answers. It's yeah. a question of choice and uniformity and being fair. But the question is that, for example, all that lovely voice and face and gestures, there's also the danger of data scraping. Like the thing is, here's a little trick. If you're judging an assessor, you want to pair up with a publisher, type in the name of the publisher of the assessment and type in tribunals into Google and see what sort of tribunals popped up uh, because there will be, it's like, is it defensible in court? Basically, you know, the salesperson who's not qualified in psychometrics will tell you this is the best. We measure 120,000 data points in the video interview. Well, what's our associated with performance? And they go, we measure 120,000 data points because that's all they know. But if you type in the, the tribunal, you'll find, okay, so here's a couple of tribunals which came up recently. And in the UK, it's public knowledge. It sometimes sips into the press. Some sad news article, journalists couldn't find anything better to write. So they wrote about tribunals and psychometrics. And that will tell you far more about the assessment than any salesperson. Uh, and um, as far as neurodiversity as well, I think one of the most kind of what I really like is elegant solutions. Uh, and that is, for example, I know an uh, organization in UK who's been focusing on neurodiverse recruitment since 1998. And now over 25% of the graduates they recruit are technically neurodiverse. And one of the key things they did is that after every graduate selection process, they gather people who made it and they actually have a chat. You know, how was the job description? How does it compare to your actual job? What threw you off? Apparently, for example, having a good sense of humor in the job description throws off people who think more laterally. Like, what do they mean? Do I have a good sense of humor? And they might not apply just because of that. Or, for example, in the selection process, sometimes people on the autistic spectrum might struggle with some SJTs. So they would make SJT optional rather in the scoring rather than a cutoff point. SJT, and Nikita, can you dumb it down for me? What does that mean? Situational judgment test. So you're presented with a situation and some options of what you're going to do. But the key thing is, do we ask applicants and, oh, my God, do we ask unsuccessful applicants? Do we learn from the process or do we rely on the publisher of the assessment? And what I find, which is really troubling right now after the pandemic, a lot of big corporates are getting rid of their internal IOs and psychometricians, and they are relying more on more what the publisher tells them which sometimes, weirdly enough, is not objective source of data. I just can't figure out why. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's so important to have internal expertise. It's so important to create processes which learn from the selection to make sure it's more it gets better with time. I think optimally, optimally, Nikki, it's really interesting you're saying about this, but I think you're right. Like the optimal scenario is that probably employers should carry psychologists in their in their HR and recruiting teams. It makes it makes sense to me that that should happen if given the fact that we are recruiting human beings into into companies. But of course, that doesn't exist as a in any kind of consistent way. I I don't know any HR department. In fact, I don't even know any business at, in any department that actually has a psychology component um, when in fact, you know, maybe we should because, you know, this is a bunch of human beings trying to get together. So that's an evolutionary step. I think maybe we get to at some point. I do wonder as well whether management will change and evolve in such a way that it becomes much more psychologically based rather than, you know, currently line manager based. So perhaps we get different types of skills into that management tier where it becomes a little less about, you know, um, uh, uh, managing performance in the old school, you know, here, the, 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 the widgets you need to produce and more about, you know, trying to create situations where people uh, are going to thrive and, you know, performance becomes, if you like, a, a natural output of people thriving. Um, go ahead, Nikita, go ahead. Thriving is so compl complicated. Let's say we take a cutoff score and we validate because psychometricians love sales departments because the KPIs are so simple, because it's sales. 
So we find that we do an assessment, we pick, you know, 10% low performers in the middle, 10% top performers. And oh my God, we find the low agreeable extroverts are the best performers. So we're gonna hire loads of them. So we hire more and more and more of them. And oh my God, later on we find out they start giving bribes. What happened? Oh, maybe in the beginning, the low agreeable extroverts took credit for the sales of other people when it was just on the cusp. And maybe they performed well in an ecosystem of diverse personalities and talent. But the moment we started to select for particular traits, we started to actually limit that diversity of personality and upset the ecosystem of talent. And actually it's doing more harm than good long term. Right. So very important point. Uh, it's basically ecosystem thinking from a psychological point of view. Do we need to have a rich and diverse psychological makeup within a business? Because we can't just isolate an individual and treat them as atomic units. They're operating within a social context and therefore the performance is within context. Again, I go back to sports, big sports fan. Anybody who watches sports will know this analogy. A great player for, for Team A. He comes to your club, Team B, and guess what? He's terrible. Is he terrible as intrinsically terrible or intrinsically great? No, he isn't. He's great within one context and bad in another context. And it's the social context that makes the difference. Okay, we've got to keep moving on, folks. By the way, before we keep doing that, um, I, we're already like nearly uh, halfway through this conversation. I want to take a moment and take a little bit of a mini pause we always do this in the middle of every uh, Brain Food Live. The reason why is because uh, we are a show that is a conversation starting com uh, sort of uh, show. Uh, we'd never want to be a bottleneck or stop a conversation that we began. Uh, so we want to make sure that continues, even if we have to come off air. So now is the time. Just grab your LinkedIn URL, share it in the chat stream, and make sure you connect with everyone else who is also doing the same. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, any of these LinkedIn channels, whether it's my LinkedIn, um, Steve, uh, Steve Jules LinkedIn, anybody else's LinkedIn, Share your URL in the comment thread there and then connect to everyone else who's done the same. Worst case scenario, you're going to walk away 20, 30, 40, 50 connections that all care about this topic. Go ahead and speak to those people offline, off air. Make sure you continue this conversation and keep it alive. Uh, OK, people are doing that. That's great. We're going to move on to the next psychological uh, uh, dimension of assessment. The most popular one these days, which is the video interview. Um, I think all of us are doing video interviews now. It's suddenly become very prominent. Remember, only three years or so ago, it was a very niche thing to do. Um, it was telephone call, then in person, suddenly this thing happens. Uh, what is the psychological impact when we say, oh, yeah, we've got a video call with somebody? Do we know, has, has there been any studies on this? Uh, Jean-Marie, let's go with you on this. Uh, have you got any data or any kind of research on the, the impact of video interviews on psycholo people's psychology? Uh, thank you, Hank. No, I don't have any data yet, uh, but that's very interesting and uh, I haven't seek for it yet, but I have a lot of uh, use cases uh, because some of the companies that I've been working with uh, use a video interview at scale. When I say at scale, I'm talking about uh, several thousand of applicants a year and uh, that you have two ways of seeing things. Uh, obviously, not all applicants want to do the video interview. And so you lose candidates in the process, uh, which is uh, some companies say, well, you get a break some eggs. Uh, this is a point that, you know, has to be discussed and you, you, you can side with, with this opinion or not. Uh, and the other way to see it is say, OK, let's offer uh, in. We don't know how it's going to be perceived. But in any case, if someone doesn't want to do the video interview, can we offer something else, which is very tricky in terms of process, but it means uh, and in terms of accessibility, this is a, a smart way as well. Is that if someone doesn't want to do the video interview, do we have another way to uh, let the people apply and move toward uh, the next stage of the process while assessing the same thing? So this is a tricky part. Uh, you have to be able to assess the same criteria in the same way because these candidates will have uh, two different uh, roads, will go to the same point later in the process but that's uh, that's what i can tell you about that and the other thing it's it's tricky about that because it means that your ats we go back to the ats we always go back to the ats in the discussion the ats needs to be able to manage two different entry points beside the job application it's like okay you have an entry point it's like an application uh, direct sourcing linkedin whatever but then on the next stage can we have parallel processes 
and uh, manage the candidates to still go uh, on the same stage later. And from what I see, even companies who want to offer more accessibility and an alternative to video interviews can't just because their tools uh, don't easily allow them to do so. And by the way, folks, uh, everybody uh, watching this, if you know a tool, an ATS that allows you to uh, have this kind of feature, I'm very interested in, um, in having the information. Here's, here's the thing that's very true, and it's probably a fundamental tension that we have, and I think it's a fair tension, it's not one of these things where it's employer bad type of scenario, is that there's a practical impediment um, to providing the, uh, the the choice to the candidate in terms of the selection process. We like we may want to do that and we want we, we think it makes sense, but it triggers basically a, a practical challenge that oftentimes we're not able to meet. Uh, so, for instance, it increases the, the 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 capacity requirements for the team. We already know TA teams are being crushed in terms of resources this year. So, how are they going to do more? Um, they're going to have to continue to simplify. So, the trend is actually to continue to standardize rather than to customize. Um, and the second thing is there is also a tyranny of the tech. Quite right, uh, Jean Marie. Like one of the things that is probably most promising with this uh, surge of, of, of AI innovation is that it might finally be able to give us the flexible software um, that is able to provide the solution because currently we don't have it. We have things that's hard coded. It's It may give you different ways in, but there'll always be still a fixed way to, to process through this, uh, this flow and it controls our lives more so than perhaps we're aware of. So for instance, uh, one thing is very sure, I mean, I know this studying the, the watch rate on brain food uh, lives, uh, we always very, very good at maintaining interest um, all the way through uh, from zero minutes to 60 minutes, but 60 minutes is a real collapse. Why? Because everyone is constrained by calendars, which just default to 60 minute slots. Um, that's not to say they wouldn't normally stay in the show because uh, they would. Uh, but it's a 60 minute thing. They've blocked that out and someone else has put something else in uh, a moment after. So we're all constrained by inflexible tools. <laughs> We've adapted our, our behavior that way. And that's going to be incompatible with, uh, you know, uh, uh, accessibility, uh, which is a huge problem. So hopefully technology will evolve and find a way uh, to change it. I want to talk about video on, video off, um, because here is, a, I think, a significant component as to, um, oh, has videos gone off? I think they did. Um, did it? <laughs> did the you guys tools just, listen to you. <laughs> I, I think the tool listened to me there because it flashed everyone off. I mean, that's scary shit. Uh, but anyway, no, um, here's important because there is firstly a gender component to this. Uh, and secondly, there is some data to, to say that video on basically improves your chances. So there's a, there's a scenario where I forget the study, I'll share it later, but there is a, a small but significant difference between the numbers of men that are prepared to go video on as default compared to women that go video on. It's it's something like a 10, 20% difference. Um, however, that difference in my view needs to be understood a little bit better. We need to find out exactly what the circumstances are there. Um, and in fact, you know, how do we treat people with or without video? We had an example earlier, uh, earlier in this show uh, ourselves, Jean-Marie. Um, I was very unhappy you didn't have a video there um, because probably my personal psychology tells me I struggle with voice only, right? Uh, so other people might have the problem. I had the problem. So um, essentially I insisted on it. So video on, video off. Is that something we can solve? Can we provide, is, uh, could avatars help? Uh, will deep fakes be a solution? Uh, what are your thoughts on this, guys? I think like maybe there's solutions, uh, but I think the fundamental for me is Again, going back to why are we doing this uh, assessment step? What's the purpose of it? What, what do we expect? Like inform the candidate, like we like to have video on for these reasons. If that doesn't feel you know, good on your behalf, please reach out. Like, like setting the expectations matters so much because then that hopefully can like level the playing field because for interviews, I mean, say that you have, social anxiety or just don't really like human interaction. That's a thing. Um, and we know that candidates that are more extroverted, more um, socially like adaptable tend to do better in interviews. And maybe that's not what we're actually measuring. So I think it's just important that we don't have our uh, made up our mind that I prefer video on or video off and therefore I will rate the candidate based on it. 
Uh, so like be open to the candidate with what you're doing and why, let them prepare and judge what's relevant. I think that's um, my take on this. Nikita, you're muted. It's all the great stuff you're saying. <laughs> no, I know. I spent the whole day without getting mute, but you know, that moment you're caught. But didn't you feel a huge level of self-satisfaction when you noticed that? But I'm just curious from Eloise, considering you're coaching neurodivergent clients, what do you hear about the selection processes? Like what surprises you in their experience? Yes. I mean, like video on and off, it's like a lot of people who are on the spectrum might have a harder time doing video on. Like it's more uncomfortable, like it's good to have the option to do it online so they can stay home. So it's already like it's a plus, but then you have to be on video, which is a minus. And I'm also always worried, like even if you say, oh, yeah, it's OK. And you know why and stuff like you would still have the bias as a recruiter, maybe if you don't see the person. So, yeah. It's also like to, even if you're alone and you say it's fine and you know in a way, you would always have at the back of your head that, of, I mean, unconsciously, like the impression the person is less likable or anything, which is a big problem with with people who are on the spectrum to not being likable because of not having body language that would match or doing eye contact, which is in video a bit less of a problem, but still like if I look there and I talk to you, that might still be a bit weird. So yeah, that's a big point especially for people on the spectrum here let me just say one thing real quick eloise uh, uh, there, we should have data on this shouldn't we there, there's a lot of video interview platforms there i wonder whether anybody listening if you're running one of these platforms like is is there a way in which you could tell us whether video on or video off has an impact on that hiring, hiring outcomes because that would actually be really powerful data for us to, to know um because it is educational for everyone to know this um, and it is going to be one of those examples where whatever assessment process you use is not going to be optimal for everyone. It's going to be someone is going to be a plus or minus to it, no matter what you do. Um, but it's important that we know um, that uh, it does have some sort of impact. Um, OK, uh, very, very good. Um, we've got to keep moving on, folks, because there's two more assessment types I want to hit before uh, before we finish the show. And by the way, my Chrome has crashed, so I'm not able to operate the, the show anymore. I'm, I'm kind of like hands free. Uh, so this is like going on for it's going to it's going to crash at some point completely. But we just got to keep going to the end. OK, um, uh, but OK, the next thing is obviously in person interview. I think this is still quite common, particularly for more senior roles, let's say. Um, you know, oh, I need to see the person um, or, you know, let's get them in. That's still a thing. Um, we know there's accessibility issues. We know there's like mobility issues. All that kind of stuff is there. Um, what other let's focus on the, the psychological component, though. Um, what what kinds of people would succeed more, would you say, in an in-person interview environment compared to people who don't? Do we have any sort of thoughts or insights on any of that? Again, I feel comfortable throwing this open to anybody. So uh, just uh, pipe up if you have a thought. I think besides the like outgoing and socially adaptable, there's also the fact of uh, um, body weight tends to impact who gets hired. Uh, mm -hmm. So that can yeah. also be something... Uh, but also like how you look in general. There was a comment on uh, favoring people that look good. I mean, that happens. Uh, so I, I, I think that, and then the classic like, ooh, after handshake, I know uh, if I'm gonna hire someone or not. Uh, so I think there's lots going on during an on-site interview. Come in, Nikki, so you're, you're on mute again, man. Uh, anyways, but uh, yeah. Uh, so just accepting all the LinkedIn messages, don't want the chimes to hear. Uh, so uh, basically, couldn't agree more with you. It's when employers go, oh, we're, you know, we don't discriminate during selection. <laughs> like selection is discrimination. Uh, and we don't use any personality assessments. And they go, but your interviewers are still assessing people's personalities. They just don't have a framework. It's still, well, my mother used to say, if a person scratches their nose from the right, you know, they're not trustworthy. Or, you know, the strength of the handshake, et cetera. People are assessing each other all the time without any models, frameworks, and it's just fascinating. You know, of course, I like that candidate. He's a Leo. And it's like, great, fantastic. Uh, and he's and right and dead. Wow. <laughs> exactly. And he's just like me. And it's just like, oh, Jesus Christ, especially with founders, man. Anyways. On that note, just to interrupt Nikita, I would really, if you are a business that's prepared to hire based on horoscopes, I want to hear from you uh, because this would be a show I want to do. I think we can measure that. Again, measure performance. Just go and do it on hor horoscopes. Like, do you perform better? Who knows? Maybe you do. Maybe there's a, maybe we should get back into cosmology. Uh, but okay. Um, 
Uh, sorry, Nikita, I interrupted you. Well, I was just talking to somebody from India, and apparently, according to that person, in India, matchmaking between couples' horoscopes are greatly used because you don't have any other information on the person. So the idea is something is better than nothing. And how often that's still true when it's a recruitment and selection processes. And like, well, some information is better than none. And it's just like mm, a little bit of information and knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah, very interesting. You just reminded me, of course, there's different types of cultures with the variance of irrationality, if you like. And I, I use irrationality in a non-pejorative way because sometimes we need to inject a bit of irrationality in our lives. Um, but it's not like what we think is a logical framework. Um, they have different components. Religious-based hiring, um, that definitely happens in, in the Western world, in the US in particular. Uh, this is explicitly, I've seen adverts explicitly saying you need to, you know, uh, be of this Christian denomination. I'm thinking, wow. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of things that uh, kind of go into recruiting for a group that is not necessarily, um, uh, that will basically clash uh, strongly with some of the values that typically exist within the HR world. Um, okay, so in-person interviews, uh, basically it's going to be extrovert bias. It's going to be biased towards people that obviously look good. Um, it, there's, there's a gender component. Uh, there's a weight component. There's a height component. Um, there's all, uh, this is one thing that Zoom has really helped short folks because um, basically it eliminates the height bias, right? Um, but it, again, it, it damages people that are not comfortable on camera. And sometimes that's obvious um, for us to review. And again, let's segue a little bit to the practical side of it. We can't solve all the problems or eliminate all the biases, but probably one of the things that job seekers need to do is think about how they come across on camera and improve Im improve that in the same way in which you know, previously you used to do interview training and, you know, there was like people giving you like sartorial tips and how to dress and stuff like this. Yes, all unfair and irrational, but if you're in a competitive market, you need to convert this interview. You got to do what you got to do. Um, okay, uh, we're moving rapidly to the end of this show, folks. So let's move forward to final kind of thoughts that we want to just share on the psychology of it. One of the things that we've kind of all agreed on, I think, is that if we can push to give the candidates some more choice as to how they make the decisions um, or how they want to be assessed, that would be a great thing to do. Um, Linnea, you mentioned also that maybe proactively describing why you're using various assessments. If you don't have that flexibility, you can just say, look, we're testing for this, this, and this. So there are a couple of tips we could use. What other things do you think we could recommend that would improve um, the recruiting processes of companies that basically make it a little bit more uh, aware or psychological aware, if you like, of, of the impact on candidates. Uh, any thoughts on that? Let's go round. Uh, Jean-Marie, let's go with you first. Yes, well, there's a topic that we did not address and that is directly linked to that is, uh, okay, I've done some assessment for a company, uh, different interviews, tools, whatever. Uh, do I get the results first? And most of the time, uh, companies don't give the feedbacks, I mean, not accurate feedbacks from these assessments because A, they don't have time, B, uh, might be tough uh, to address this feedback because uh, if you're not trained, it's difficult to provide a feedback that can be quite personal when we're talking about assessment. Uh, but then from a candidate point of view, you give a lot during the process. And so if you don't have a real answer, and I'm not talking just like positive, negative, but if you don't have an answer about uh, uh, about the expectations, about uh, what you've given, uh, what you're giving, what you're receiving back, uh, it, it kind of like leave an imbalance. And this is uh, from a psychological point of view. This is some some things that can be difficult in a short to long term. Uh, so what do I? So do I get the results? And then if I am lucky enough to have the results. What do I do with the results? And so as companies and as HR, we should give the results, of course. We should give more details than we do on market. The market is very low at the moment on the, on the level of details that we give in our feedbacks. And there's a question that we never ask a candidate because we consider it's not our job anymore. How do you feel about that? Yeah. Because it's not, a it's not an HR job. Uh, to to manage the candidate uh, when he's left the process. But then, as we are talking about the psychological uh, consequences uh, of assessment, this is a direct one. What do I do with the results I'm given? Okay, quick summary. Very good, Jean-Marie. I have this concept from, from physics. It's like energy in, energy out. 
So in other words, if a candidate has actually gone through an assessment process that you've constructed, you need to reciprocate a kind of equivalent level of energy back and do so immediately, even before a result is happening. And in fact, just to address Martina's point on the feedback is challenging mm -hmm. litigation risk. I agree. People are going to be upset with rejection or no one enjoys rejection. However, this is why you should deploy the feedback prior to decision. So in other words, you can just tell them, hey, listen, this worked really well. You did it. This is great. You could have improved in these areas. These are all going to be factored in and we'll get back to you with an outcome. Something like that. I think people would appreciate the recognition that some effort has gone in. Um, and the final thing you could say, how do you feel about the experience? Again, just to, to signal that you're listening um, to what the person is wanting to say. What, the, the most outrageous moment, the moments of outrage that we have is when we feel we're not being heard. Um, that's the only time when I go like completely nuts, apart from when I get the capture thing coming on on my screen. Um, but uh, if you're not being heard, it's super frustrating. So very easy fixes there. Okay, Nikita, real quick, man, give us one thing that companies can do to improve uh, thinking about the psychology of the candidate. Sweat the small stuff. Sweat the job description. Sweat the little things about the assessment, how it's designed, when it was designed, cultural biases, etc. Uh, realize that maybe asking your candidates, which John, as John Marie was saying, how do they feel? How what did they think of the selection process? And make sure that you embed some sort of way to continuously validate and improve. Be it uh, post-selection interviews with the group, ask them about the selection process. Make sure you're gathering data about actually performance, discrimination of your assessments, all of that stuff. Don't just trust your assessment provider, have internal expertise. When you want to talk about neurodiversity, go talk to an educational psychologist. When you want to go about mental health, go talk to a clinical psychologist. When you want to see how it com all comes together, talk to an occupational psychologist. A and uh, trust me, a little bit of money spent on consulting fees will potentially save you a lot, be it in litigation. But most importantly, it will help you, your clients and your candidates get what they really want, which is a job that is right for them. Because afterwards, when they apply, that's the aim. Can I also say something? I, I personally think that recruiters and HR people would really appreciate and enjoy more education on psychology. Um, so, so we should probably agitate for that. Like, where's that in L and D? You know, like, like go and go and grab some of this stuff. Very good, Nikita. Okay, go to you, Eloise. What thing could companies do to improve when you're thinking about candidate psychology on assessments? Yeah, just I think awareness and training of hiring teams to to know what like what is the impact of the different step, what is, for example, the consequences of behavior or questions like that can be also a big like a big point where neurodivergent people get put on at side. So yeah, like really just awareness of like what are the actions you're doing and how is it impacting the people. So you can still doing them, but at least you will know if you don't get the answer you expect or you feel something that is not what you would expect, then you can also readjust your, your question. Yeah, very, very good. Um, okay, Linnea, final word to you. Um, what sort of things companies do to improve this stuff? I think level the playing field. Um, describe how you're not perfect. Be a little bit personal, like both in the job description, in the interview. I try to you know, open with, oh, I just made this mistake to show that you're human and kind of like, I'm not the scary person judging you. I'm also human. I think that's my, a small thing, but important one. You know what? I really love that as the final point. Um, uh, recruitment, as we've set it up, is all very systematized. It's pr process driven. There's numbers. Uh, well, numbers, in my view, are literally dehumanizing, right? So everyone's a number. Right? We have conversion rates. So obviously, we are dehumanizing people. That we have to do that because that's what, you know, we're running through a professional way of doing things. However, one of the ways that we can't ignore the psychological impact of that, and one of the ways you can kind of move, smooth it out a little bit is to fess it up as, as a recruiter yourself to humanize the process. Just explain, hey, listen, this is how it's going to be. And I think that's when we're going to uh, have a, a little bit more um, of equity 
in what is fundamentally an unbalanced uh, uh, relationship. Uh, folks, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I definitely think there's more to say. I'd love to do a part two if everyone's interested in this. If so, let me know in the comments if you wanted to see our wonderful guests back. I think we probably do. It's been one of the funnest shows we've done. And again, this should be two hour conversation, but the tyranny of the calendar, I know people are dropping off as, as we speak. Uh, so we can't do it anymore. We're going to have to close it off there. So I want to thank all of you for watching. I want to thank our wonderful guests, uh, Jean-Marie uh, Cayo, I think that's how you pronounce. Um, is that correct? Thank you very much. Um, we have Nikita Mihailov. Thank you so much for your contribution. Eloise Tom, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Linnea Bywall, thank you so much for being co-host today. Thank you also to our sponsors, Tripad, tripad.com. Check them out if you need to upgrade your ATS away from some of these things that ask you to, call, to set up a new account on every application. That's crazy talk. Uh, upgrade your ATS, folks. It's something that's critical uh, to candidate experience and also improving the mental health of all those poor candidates you're subjecting to these horrendous assessments. Uh, okay, um, we're going to close it off there. We're back next week. What are we talking about? Oh, we're talking about another psychological sort of thing. Very interestingly, I believe it is what happens when you're put on blast um, how to handle negative publicity where a candidate has gone online and given you crap. Uh, okay, so this is kind of a, a, a nice segue to the next episode. We've actually got Nadia uh, Vakalidis. I think she's called Vakalidis. She actually had this situation very recently. Uh, candidate no happy when a massive multi-comment screed on LinkedIn. That went viral and Natad Nadia had to deal with it and I thought she dealt with it really well. Uh, we're going to interview Natalia one-on-one -on -one, and we're going to figure out how she handled that but also open up the conversation. What happens when you do have unhappy candidates that have really gone to task and you know really tried to, uh, to have a word with you publicly? Make sure you join uh, the show. That's already set up. Follow the channel if you enjoy the chat. And have a great weekend, everybody. Okay, Thanks. I can't actually... Keep Cheers, bye-bye. I'm just going to have to click X on Chrome, and I don't know what happens. So everyone leave. Everyone's going to leave. Bye. Right, have a good weekend, everyone. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, I cancel this. It goes. I think it disappears. No. Yep, it does. Uh, do I... Can I add the broadcast? Yes, I can.